Good evening, everyone. I'm Bob Douglas, and welcome. Last week, Connecticut Public Television broadcast a documentary entitled Brass Valley, a look at the brass workers of the Naugatuck Valley and their struggles to form a union and to survive. Tonight, we offer a reaction to that program with the documentary's co-producer and labor historian and a prominent Connecticut labor leader. And before we meet our guests and discuss the documentary, here's a brief excerpt from Brass Valley. By the onset of World War II, Mine Mill was becoming a significant force in the American labor movement. Its 60,000 members spanned every segment of a thriving copper and brass industry, and its president sat on the executive board of the CIO. But then, a bitter internal dispute broke out, the first in a series of events that would eventually lead to the decimation of Mine Mill. In 1941, John Driscoll, a Mine Mill organizer and a native of Waterbury, claimed that Mine Mill's top leadership was following the political line of the Communist Party. Reed Robinson, president of Mine Mill, condemned Driscoll's attack as nothing but a personal power grab. The following year, Driscoll unsuccessfully challenged Robinson for the presidency of the Union. Two rival factions formed within Mine Mill. Robinson's forces were called the Left Wing Faction, and Driscoll's group was called the Right Wing Faction. There were charges and countercharges, and throughout World War II, the Mine Mill and Smelter Workers Union was at war with itself. The struggle was particularly fierce in the Brass Valley. The right wing group, uh, as well as the left wing group, you know, used to be throwing snowballs at one another rather than fighting the company, we were fighting each other. In fact, I recall distinctly every time we went to a meeting, and then at night, uh, you know, everybody had try to get to the back of the hall, so you'd have back be, your back would be against the wall rather than have somebody come behind you and hit you with a chair or something, you know. I know I used to feel awfully bad. I'd go in and people I work with, I'm standing on this side of the hall and people I work with all there standing over me and saying, we were really at each other, you know, dog eat dog, and it was very bad. The growing menace of communism arouses the House of Representatives Un-American Activities Committee. Among the well-informed witnesses testifying is J. Edgar Hoover, head of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Mr. Hoover speaks with authority on the subject. The factional fight within Mine Mill came to a head right after World War II, when America was in the grip of the biggest Red Scare since the Palmer Raids of 1919 and 1920. A leading figure in this was J. Edgar Hoover, the same man who had directed the attack on immigrant labor groups after World War I. Communism in reality is not a political party. It is a way of life, an evil and malignant way of life. It reveals a condition akin to disease that spreads like an epidemic. And like an epidemic, a quarantine is necessary to keep it from infecting this nation. Companies everywhere were quick to exploit public sentiment, and they used the fear of communist influence as a way of discrediting the entire labor movement. In the Brass Valley, the Scoville Manufacturing Company attack unions in editorials like this one. Labor unions are particularly susceptible to infiltration by communists. The strike weapon is largely controlled by an aggressive minority. Disruption of production, violence, and hardship which accompany strikes are essential parts of the communist creed of revolution. We say, give them back to Russia. In 1947, Locals loyal to the right-wing faction seceded from Mine Mill and eventually joined the United Auto Workers. Two years later, Mine Mill was expelled from the CIO, along with ten other unions that were accused of being communist-dominated. Mine Mill was deprived of all rights under federal labor laws and suffered years of harassment, subversive activities charges, and raiding by other unions. In 1967, a seriously weakened mine mill merged with the United Steelworkers of America. With the workers now split up into different unions, it became more difficult for them to bargain with the giant copper and brass corporations. Workers like John Gaddison were keenly aware of how strong they might have been if they'd stayed in one union. That was one of the best setups that, you know, we could have had, because you're dealing strictly in one industry. But, uh, Things went wrong, and my mill went under, and then we were chopped up, and we've been kind of powerless since then. Not that force 
if we had got out of mine mill rock stock and barrel and went into the um, steel workers or went into the auto workers or whatnot but if we should have all gone one way a brief excerpt from the documentary brass valley now we welcome to our program jeremy brecker he is a co-producer of brass valley and a labor historian and it is also our privilege to welcome to our program john j driscoll John is the president of the Connecticut State Labor Council, AFL-CIO. Gentlemen, welcome to our program. Jeremy, let me ask you first. Uh, take us back to the uh, beginning of Brass Valley. How did it start? How did the project get underway? And was it, what was it that you were trying to do and say? It really began with the uh, three of us, myself, Jan Stackhouse, and Jerry Lombardi, mm -hmm. uh, who have been very much influenced by what's known as history from below. You know, many people... Uh, I'm sure have had the experience of uh, having history classes and which they uh, just uh, learned about great men, generals, politicians, uh, uh, captains of industry and felt, gee, where are people like me and my family, my parents, ordinary people mm -hmm. uh, in this story, in this history? Because so often the way history is presented, uh, it doesn't have the story of ordinary people in it. And uh, to correct that, there developed in the last couple of decades quite a strong movement to tell history from below, to tell the story of women, of blacks and other minorities, and of working people, uh, and especially to allow them to speak for themselves and uh, participate in filling in the parts of the historical record that have not been told. Did you have a particular interest in brass workers uh, and the labor movement? Uh, I've been a labor historian uh, since the, the uh, beginning of the 1970s, and I'd always wanted to find a community where uh, we could do an in-depth study mm -hmm. where there were lots of people who were around who remembered the old days and could tell us about it. Uh, and uh, I had lived near uh, Waterbury, in the, not in the Naugatuck Valley, but the next valley mm -hmm. most of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it seemed like a very good place for this kind of program. And what we did was a very much a community-based project. From the beginning, our goal was to involve many community people, uh, especially brass workers, retired brass workers, and their families. By the time we were done, we had uh, 200 people who had worked with the project in one way or another, uh, most of them brass workers, retired brass workers, and family members, uh, up and down the Naugatuck Valley, who uh, had either been interviewed or helped us find people to interview, helped us find old photographs, uh, or otherwise participated. And we also had a community labor advisory panel, which included the presidents of uh, six of the brass worker local unions uh, in the Naugatuck Valley, and also included uh, five retired brass workers and a number of other community members. And we talked with them, they helped us, they looked at drafts of our uh, uh, book mm -hmm. and rough edits of the movie and gave us a tremendous amount of additional understanding. Our attitude was that the workers who have worked in these plants and who have lived in these communities really are the experts. They are the people who know the story of their lives as they've experienced it. Uh, and it's for us as, uh, as historians to go to them and find out what we can learn from them. Mm -hmm. John Driscoll, I'm sure you remember those days uh, well. Uh, take us back to those times and, and your, your reaction to this project, John. Well, I criticize this film um, because um, it misrepresents uh, the struggle that the uh, workers in that industry uh, had to make to develop their unions. It uh, downgrades the benefits they derive from uh, their uh, organized efforts, and it totally, falsely presents the struggle which they made to get rid of an outside political force uh, from the unions that they organized. And I think I qualify uh, as someone who can speak about history from below as uh, Mr. Brecker puts it, because I worked in those mills. Uh, I uh, was a volunteer organizer for the union, the mine mill union, when it first started. Mm -hmm. I was later asked to go on the staff to help organize. 
I negotiated most of the first contracts that were negotiated. Well, in fact, uh, I was the uh, sub-regional director for the UAW for uh, almost 20 years. Uh, and um, I know that the union and the movement there didn't result in a series of strikes and struggles, uh, internal struggles such as Mr. Brecker and his associates have portrayed. In the almost 50 years uh, since the uh, mine mill was brought into uh, Waterbury, uh, not more than 10 years of it was spent in struggling with the uh, communist uh, operators who uh, managed to get control of the top leadership of that union. Uh, the struggle was not um, one which was uh, in any way influenced by uh, the House on american Activities Committee or J. Edgar Hoover. I'd say, uh, Jeremy, that uh, the late Senator Joe McCarthy uh, would have given you high marks for the smear job you did on the uh, movement to get rid of the communists because without actually making the charge, you portray the effort of the workers involved as being inspired by a kind of red baiting and uh, fanatic anti-communism, which uh, uh, is as exemplified by J. Edgar, J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, the uh, struggle had nothing to do with that. If Mr. Brecker is really interested in, in a movement of workers, uh, which was not you know, guided or helped or aided by any outside force, he would take a closer look at that struggle in the, U in the mine mill and smelter workers, which resulted finally in getting uh, the people involved, most of them, into a really strong union, the UAW, which from, for the next 20 years was able to do a great deal of good for them. And uh, most of all, this movie seems to uh, say, and I've talked to several other people who got this impression, that um, the uh, struggle in the mine mill weakened the union and has resulted in uh, the conditions that exist today I'd like to point out that both the unions that Mr. Gaddison mentioned, the steel workers and the auto workers, have suffered the same kind of fate as the uh, unions in the brass industry because of an enormous physical, I mean economic trend brought on by the great rush of imports in this country. Mm -hmm. And uh, no matter how strong a union, it can't operate to produce additional benefits during a, a depression, a recession, an economic downturn in, in the industry, which is what has gone on in the brass industry now. Mm -hmm. Jeremy Brecker, I'm sure you have a reaction and a comment. Uh, would you like to ask a question, or what is your uh, general reaction to uh, some of Mr. Driscoll's concerns? Well, uh, I'd first like to uh, make sure that, I, as I understand it, the real, the two basic concerns are, first of all, the portrayal of the labor movement and its role, nature of strikes and their role in the labor movement, number one. And number two, more specifically, the uh, internal fight in Mine Mill in the 1940s, that those are really the two basic areas that your concerns are about. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, the, uh, let me say that uh, Mr. Driscoll uh, has, uh, was one of that more than 100 people that we interviewed. That he was extremely helpful to us in the research phases of our project. And I want to acknowledge that help and uh, say that I'm, I'm very sorry that we've obviously not succeeded in making something that you can be satisfied with, but that uh, personally that this is a source of regret to me. And I'm very glad that you have an opportunity to express these views publicly in an appropriate forum where lots of people who've seen the movie can also hear your comments. I think that underlying uh, the question here uh, is really uh, in some way, and uh, Mr. Driscoll has pointed out completely uh, validly that he is an experienced uh, person. He lived through a great deal of this history uh, and that he was a major protagonist of the matters that have been described in the movie. And it seems to me that the, uh, uh, he's very proud of his role and that that's quite proper. Uh, he's also head of the Connecticut State AFL-CIO and he has responsibilities for uh, protecting the 
uh, uh, image of the institution of which he's the head. As a historian, I have a very different set mm -hmm. of responsibilities and obligations. Uh, my responsibility, first of all, is to explore different aspects of the past, how different individuals and groups have experienced things, to try to understand where different groups are coming from, uh, and um, and then to try to present those different approaches in a, in a context where people can understand them and see that they're why different people had different views. Mm -hmm. um, okay. John, do you see anything positive from your point of view uh, in Brass Valley, or do you see it as a total or a partial misrepresentation from your point of view? Well, I see a, a, a real value in the first part of it where the early struggles of uh, workers in the industry to uh, try to gain some measure of uh, mm -hmm. justice and uh, dignity in their, uh, in their work. Uh, but I suggest that the same kind of, uh, of effort that uh, went into the struggles of 1920, 21, 1919, 21, uh, were the same kind of struggles uh, that the uh, workers in that industry uh, went through uh, from 1937 on, including the struggle they made to get rid of the communist influence, communist domination uh, of the uh, mine mill union. And I'm not talking opinions now because in 1949, uh, the CIO itself, not any outside agency, mm -hmm. not the FBI, mm -hmm. not the House on American Activities Committee, mm -hmm. but the CIO trade union group, after a thorough investigation, including uh, getting testimony and affidavits from former officers of the mine mill and smaller workers, uh, brought in a verdict which was uh, you know, endorsed by the national CIO uh, that this union was thoroughly communist dominated. So we weren't fighting uh, any phony uh, or anything mythical. We weren't, it wasn't a struggle for John Driscoll's personal power as uh, Robinson is is quoted as saying, mm -hmm. I couldn't possibly have carried on that struggle uh, by myself because uh, it was evident that there was, you know, rank and file support, not only in, in the mine mill union, I was early on a secretary treasurer of the state CIO, and I found that the same struggle was going on. <clears throat> a couple of other unions that had communist uh, characters in them, mm -hmm. um, the uh, UE, uh, the uh, UAW, it wasn't until late, in the late f uh, 40s that Ruther was able to get elected president of that union and then the following year he was able to get a convention uh, which succeeded in eliminating practically all communist influence in it. It was one of the reasons we wanted to get into it, but more so because we had early on an experience dealing with the uh, UAW. Uh, one of the brass plants for, of the American brass was in Detroit. We got to know them, the kind of uh, dedicated, solid trade unionists they were. We contrasted that with the kind of people who uh, the, the Communist Party had uh, managed to get into the union, who during the war did their best to give away some of the gains the union had made. The first contract they, uh, uh, one of their leaders signed in the um, uh, Lux Clock situation in Waterbury, mm -hmm. gave up time and a half for Saturday. Mm -hmm. All through the war, they were uh, screaming about the Second Front. There was a basic anti-war sentiment that prevailed in the uh, early 1940s, right up to the time of Pearl Harbor. The only reason that uh, the mine mill uh, comrades, communists, whatever, uh, were found out by the workers was that they so quickly switched from uh, pre June 1941, when Russia was attacked by its former partner, mm -hmm. Nazi Germany, uh, they switched from an anti-war stance overnight. I was in Joplin, Missouri as a delegate to the Convention of the Mine Mill and Small Workers, the day that Hitler launches attack on, on Russia. The day, uh, uh, that day in the morning, mine mill uh, whips, Communist Party whips were passing out um, leaflets proclaiming the need for staying out of the war. The next day, the very next day, they had a resolution of the convention, all out aid to Soviet Russia. Mm -hmm. You know, workers are not dumb. 
they can see, you know, when there's a switch like that, that the people involved are not honest trade unionists. They're working for some outside political force. Mm -hmm. So that was carried on all through the war. Uh, and, uh, well, we weren't able to get the CIO to do anything about it because Phil Murray uh, was greatly influenced by Roosevelt, who didn't want any boat rocking while we were in a war which, uh, where we were allies with Soviet Russia. Mm -hmm. But the movement kept on. You know, it, it didn't die out. Uh, it didn't have any extraneous support for it. It was a real movement. Mm -hmm. uh, did you get any of that reaction or feeling with some of the workers that you talked with? Well, that's, uh, it's striking to me uh, that uh, uh, in the, uh, well, first of all, I want to say that we interviewed uh, some of Mr. Driscoll's closest associates and got very much the same account. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, uh, 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 many of the points that he made uh, are, in fact, included mm -hmm. uh, as part of the story, uh, as part of their interpretation of the events in uh, the more extended version in the book, Grass Valley, mm -hmm. that goes along with the movie. Mm -hmm. the, uh, and in the uh, uh, short amount of time we had yeah. here, we were obviously limited in what we could deal with. But I do want to uh, point, uh, let me say that I've not received a single phone call, and the project has not received a single, single phone call or letter uh, from anybody other than uh, a call that I received some time ago from Mr. Driscoll uh, making this kind of criticism of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what that means. But I do want to say uh, that uh, the movie, the little segment that we just watched, mm -hmm. uh, does in fact specifically make the point that you made, namely that mine mill uh, the mine mill and smelter workers union was expelled from the CIO um, along with 10 other unions that were accused of being communist dominated. And I specifically included that uh, because, well, I couldn't establish in this movie what were the real internal politics of mine mill. And I can tell you that in myself, having now studied it for five years, I'm still hoping I'm going to find a bundle of letters that's going to explain what were the real inner workings of mine mill. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the, this particular uh, reference to the committee report, uh, which uh, I think also had some comments on you on it uh, as well, uh, was uh, specifically this uh, expulsion process was explicitly mentioned so that people would know that Mr. Stritchville's charges were not coming out of the blue mm -hmm. and that important segments of the uh, labor movement agreed with him. Mm -hmm. John, well, I, I, go ahead. See, I think that a you know a more basic uh, mm -hmm. uh, from a trade union point of view uh, problem is that Mr. Brecker's portrayal of what the union did uh, makes it look in uh, whatever it is an hour and a half of a film makes it look as though uh, the the workers were confronted with nothing but strikes uh, during the period of union organization. Uh, a large part of the time is spent in the struggle against the communists who were really eliminated after 1950. Uh, and does not tell about the real benefits which the unions uh, brought to the workers there and which retain, are retained. I mean, the I kind of standard of I, living. I, let me respond to this because I, there are a couple of things here that I, I think are important. Uh, first of all, as far as strikes go, I, it's, for example, I, I just think the. Uh, uh, maybe we should watch the movie again because for, specifically we just uh, have uh, your longtime associate Bill Moriarty describing how recognition was won at the American Brass Company without a strike. Our narrator, narrator states explicitly that unions were involved in public service and ca political campaigns and that they became major factors in the role of the labor movement after World War II. Uh, the question of the communist uh, and uh, left and right fight in Mine Mill being a major part of the movie. The movie is an hour and a half long, and the entire discussion of it is the four and a half minute segment, yeah. which was shown at the beginning of this program. Mm -hmm. And there's a very good reason for that, because we were trying not to deal primarily with issues of national uh, or even regional union politics. We were trying to deal with the experience of people who lived and worked in these communities and in these factories. And that's why the great majority of this movie is about the experience of those people. Mm -hmm. What a go ahead, John. Well, the strike, uh, you know, the strike which gives uh, to which I give the most uh, 
time, the Skull Strike in 1952, you mentioned the problems that the uh, workers had. You have Sid Monty saying, you know, he didn't expect the, uh, the mass support that he got from the workers, and that uh, uh, in nowhere in that uh, film is there any indication of what the strike was about, what the workers gained, the fact that it came not as a... Excuse me, can I interrupt again? Uh, because the end segment of that, and I wish we could show it, is uh, a series of people, including Sid Monty and including a woman who worked in the shop, tr laying out what they gained. Uh, and in fact, it's a high, an emotional high point of the movie to say, we really won something. Uh, so, uh, it, Is your difference, John, is it a question of degree or, or real substance well, here, I guess? The impression I got after okay. watching it, not uh, once I uh, saw the film twice, uh, was that, uh, you know, your average worker, uh, person, viewer would say, uh, what's the use of, uh, of the union? What good does it do them? Look at the condition they're in today. Actually, and one of the, uh, one of the um, people associated with uh, Mr. Brecker is quoted uh, as saying that the purpose of the film is to show the struggle uh, workers had in a dying community. Now, I dare say that... Uh, Excuse me, I, I won't associate myself with that, that remark. I regard uh, the towns of the Nogatuck Valley as very live, yeah. uh, with a very, very rich and valuable heritage, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one to be preserved. Mm -hmm. But the, the, uh, the latter part of the film shows the uh, workers having to make concessions, the unions had to give up this, had to give up that, uh, things are a lot tougher. What union today isn't facing that? Mm -hmm. It isn't a question of a union that was weakened, as Mr. Gaddison was quoted as saying, uh, by uh, internal strike. All unions are up against that today. The Teamsters Union, the biggest union in the country, has had to make serious concessions. Mm -hmm. right? uh, the point I'd like to make before we get through Very quickly. Is Mr. Brecker has made selective interviews. He's, he has not interviewed people who could have given mm -hmm a different picture of what the union okay. did and what was involved in that mine mill struggle. John Driscoll, thank you. Jerry, I'll give you 10 seconds. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I'd like to quote Ted Barrett, the head of the uh, uh, okay. region in this district. Out, uh, the unions and their workers are at a crossroads. Grass Valley can help all of us understand that our collective history holds the strength for us to face the challenges of the present and ones yet unknown. And I'm, sure this, and I'm sure this discussion could go on and on. Jeremy Brecker, I thank you. John Driscoll, thank you kindly for being here. Okay. That's our program. I'm Bob Douglas. We thank you and good night. presentation of Connecticut Public Television.
Thousands of brass workers were jobless. For those who still had work, conditions deteriorated. I was working for 19 and a half cents an hour, 55 hours a week. Now, no overtime. You see, it was all straight time. And, uh, of course, no vacations, no holidays, no nothing, you see. I mean, no pensions. I have those, those things were just pie in the sky. The company said complete control. A farm would stand at a clock Friday, and there'd be a layoff. And uh, people would line up to ring out. And the farm would stand at that clock, and people would sweat because you didn't know who he was going to say, you don't come back Monday. We'll let you know when we need you. And, you know, you, you, the wages you were paying was just hand to mouth. So if you lost three days of work, you were in trouble. As the Depression wore on, many unemployed workers survived from day to day on the charity of the community. A pile of worn out clothing, a bag of groceries. But in the midst of despair, a new spirit of activism was born. Across the country, workers began marching and organizing to win some of the things which they felt had been denied for too long. Justice on the job and the right to form unions. But their efforts were often met with violent resistance from companies and police. In the face of such resistance, workers began developing new tactics, like the sit-down strike. They blockaded themselves inside the plants and refused to come out until they'd won their demands. In the Brass Valley, the Benrus Company was one place where workers won a pay raise by sitting down. Helen Johnson was working there at the time. As we were going out the night before, there was a notice on the, on the clock, and we were on that. And I don't remember now, but uh, Waterbury Company's, uh, Waterbury Clock was giving the, their employees a raise. And uh, so I'm not quite sure, but, but anyhow, um, we hadn't heard anything. So we came, nobody ever, never, nobody ever knew who started this, or wasn't too much said about it. But the next day, we all walked in there in the morning, three floors, and with papers and uh, magazine books and all that, and we sat. Meanwhile, in the mining towns of the West, there was a union, the Mine Mill and Smelter Workers. People who belonged to Mine Mill, as it was called, worked in copper and zinc mines that were owned by Anaconda and Kennecott. When the miners went on strike, those companies could live off the profits from their Naugatuck Valley brass plants and defeat the miners by waiting them out. But what if the workers organized themselves in every job, from the mines to the consumer, just like the copper and brass companies had done? Around 1935, the miners pitched in some money to send union organizers to the brass mills back east. There were uh, rumors of uh, a scuttle, but that they wanted to uh, start a union. And they called a meeting for a very sp specific small group of people that they might be interested at Workman's Hall on Spencer Avenue. <clears> there <throat> was a socialist organization. We got up there, and there was a, a fellow by the name of Jess Gonzalez, who was in from uh, Pennsylvania originally, but I think he came out of Montana. He was one of the organizers for uh, Mind Mill and Workers. <coughs> Very nice guy. Talked to us and explained unionism to us and so forth. Told us how we needed it. and. Uh, of course, we knew it. I mean, he wasn't telling us anything we didn't know. I mean, uh, two years in a factory, you found out the structure, you found out what you were up against, you found out if you didn't have the right name or the right connections or the right attitude, uh, you weren't going to go anyplace. Mine Mill was part of a new movement called the CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations. The CIO philosophy was this. In each industry, there should be one big union that would include all the workers, whether skilled or unskilled, male or female, Irish or Italian, black or white. And even though that made sense to many workers, actually joining the union was a difficult step. A lot of them didn't want to join. They just didn't want to pay that dollar. And they thought it was, uh, a lot of them had the uh, idea if they joined the union that they would get fired which they put that fear, the roller would say, well, hey, look, if you join a union, you're going to lose your job. And he used to scare them. They were uh, 
indoctrinated against unions. I mean, you know, all the press and everything was uh, against unions, radicals, and so forth. And uh, we had a beautiful community here, and the uh, brass people were so good to us and all that. So we didn't need anything like that. We didn't need any radicals or socialists, communists in this area. And that, that was the kind of thing that, uh, and most people uh, believe that. Well, now, naturally, uh, most of these company had a paternalistic attitude towards workers. You know, you don't want no union. Why should you pay dues? We'll take care of you. Well, they didn't mention which way they would take care of you. you know. Despite their fear of company reprisal, workers found in the union movement a potential solution to some of the problems they faced at work, and the idea caught on. Some of their demands were the same ones workers had fought for two decades earlier in 1920. Shorter hours, better working conditions, equal pay for equal work. But there were some new demands too, like job security and an end to favoritism in hiring and promotions. The American Brass Company in Waterbury was the first place where workers gained enough strength to call for a union election. Bill Moriarty was on the organizing committee. At that time, you didn't have to show 51 percent of strength in order to get an election. You had to show what they call show interest in the plan. Well, we showed interest, uh, and we finally got the election. Make a long story short, and won it. But we didn't have a union. All we had was an election won because I don't think we had actually. Well, I think if we said 15 percent of the people in the plant in the union, it would be exaggerating. <coughs> but it was a step, and uh, we worked on it, and uh, finally uh, uh, got a contract, the first contract. All we wanted to do was get somebody's name on the contract, ink it, I mean, you know, because we didn't have any bargaining stakes, we knew it, you know, and uh, we got it. As America crept slowly out of the Depression, the mine mill organizing drive gained momentum. The nation was heading towards involvement in World War II, and factories were gearing up for war production. The demand for labor was growing, and workers began to assert their power. They used creative tactics like radio programs and sound trucks. And workers who were already organized helped those who were still struggling for union recognition. After he joined the union, there was a strike at the buckle shop on South Main Street in Waterbury. They asked for volunteers to help support the picket lines because they were all women in the plant. We men were supposed to add militancy to the picket lines. Well, brother, we, they didn't need us because those women were tougher than we ever were. <laughs> yeah, I went down and I parked my car quite an old block block and a half away, which I don't know what made me do, but I was very happy that I did. And I walked down and there was a big picket line, both solid women there. By the time I got there, I'm watching this woman start through the picket line. By the time she got to the door, she didn't have any clothes on. And, uh, another incident that uh, I really liked was that when we're going through and uh, all of a sudden she claps and uh, nobody knew what happened. The police come over and they took over the telephone booth and they got a squad car and they took her up and examined her and, uh, to find out what was happening. And uh, they passed a handbag along the picket line, a real old uh, large cloth handbag. And uh, they handed it down and it came to me and I, yeah, it was pretty heavy. I come to find out there was a frying pan in that handbag. That handbag had been in the vicinity of the spot where this girl had tried to go through. By the early 1940s, workers at the big three brass plants and at many smaller shops had won formal union recognition. But that was just the beginning. During those years, the workforce itself was changing, mainly because of World War II. Black men were entering the mills in larger numbers. Some white women were doing men's jobs, just like in World War I. And black women, who had been systematically excluded from the brass plants, were finally hired under community pressure. 
The presence of these groups in the brass industry put the CIO philosophy to the test. Would the union protect all the workers, or just the white men who still dominated the workforce? I got married, I had a child, and uh, my baby was six months old and the war broke out. And they were calling for people in the American brass. And I went down there and I was hired immediately. I worked and then they decided to break me in on welding. But before I got a chance to be broken in on welding, um, uh, some fellow that represented the, the union, I knew nothing about the labor movement. I had no idea what the labor movement was about. He came over and decided uh, that I should be paid more money. Uh, I believe at the time when I started, I was getting either 50 or 75 cents an hour for doing a man's job. I was doing exactly what a man was doing. Um, lo and behold, about a month or two later, they handed me a check for about $100, retroactive back pay, because I was doing this type of work. The union's victory for women proved to be a temporary one. After the war, women like Rachel Doolady had to quit working altogether, or else go back to the traditional lower-paying women's jobs. The better-paying jobs once again became the province of men. As for black workers, the union contract specified equal rights and opportunities for everyone. But deep-seated racial prejudice continued to make that very difficult to achieve. The hot and heavy was always shoved on the, on the blacks in this, uh, in this area. And it was, took them a long time to break into the jobs that were a little better in terms of uh, working conditions or pay even uh, than normal because uh, the bosses did everything they could to keep them there because they knew the, the white guys uh, just wouldn't take it for as long as the blacks did. Yeah, like my mother always said she did, that she was always stuck on this certain chucking machine that she ate it. And, uh... Grace Cummings' mother went to work at the Scoville Manufacturing Company during the war. A lot of foremen didn't want blacks in the shop in the first place. They were forced to do it, and, but they would make it hard for you and hope that you would quit. You got the dirty, nasty jobs, and you got the jobs that didn't make any money. You just went and did, did your job, get yelled at all day, and come home. Uh, and there hardly, you hardly even knew the, the white girl working next to you. You hardly ever knew her name because she didn't associate with you, you know, even though you were doing the same thing. There were no kind of association whatsoever. John Gaddison went to work at American Brass in 1940. I was, uh, well, hit, dis disliked because of my involvement in, in the union. The uh, particular supervisor just did not like uh, union representatives of any type, any form. I was uh, just like a handyman, floor man, as they call it, and I was looking for um, an increase in pay and I wanted to uh, elevate myself. So I tried to uh, get a job, and he said that he had picked a man. And I said, well, I have the senior. This man come, just come in here, and I've been in here for years. And he said, well, that's all right. That's my prerogative. I said, no, it isn't either. It goes by seniority. And he gave me on that, and I uh, took over the job, and it requires a lot of training. And he said to me, that same foreman, he said to me, he said, well, I've got to give it to you because my superiors told me I have to give it to you. But there's the job. You take it, but nobody's going to break you in. You're going to break yourself in. And if you can't do it in so many days, then you don't have the job. By the onset of World War II, Mine Mill was becoming a significant force in the American labor movement. Its 60,000 members spanned every segment of a thriving copper and brass industry and its president sat on the executive board of the CIO. But then, a bitter internal dispute broke out, the first in a series of events that would eventually lead to the decimation of Mine Mill. In 1941, John Driscoll, a Mine Mill organizer and a native of Waterbury, claimed that Mine Mill's top leadership was following the political line of the Communist Party. Reed Robinson, president of Mine Mill, condemned Driscoll's attack as nothing but a personal power grab. The following year, Driscoll unsuccessfully challenged Robinson for the presidency of the Union. Two rival factions formed within Mine Mill. 
Robinson's forces were called the Left Wing Faction, and Driscoll's group was called the Right Wing Faction. There were charges and countercharges, and throughout World War II, the Mine Mill and Smelter Workers Union was at war with itself. The struggle was particularly fierce in the Brass Valley. The right wing group, uh, as well as the left wing group, you know, used to be throwing snowballs at one another rather than fighting the company, we were fighting each other. In fact, I recall distinctly every time we went to a meeting and then at night, uh, you know, everybody tried to get to the back of the hall, so you'd have back be, your back would be against the wall rather than have somebody come behind you and hit you with a chair or something, you know. I know I used to feel awfully bad. I'd go in and people I work with, I'm standing on this side of the hall and people I work with all there standing over me. And say, we were really at each other, you know, dog eat dog, and it was very bad. The growing menace of communism arouses the House of Representatives Un-American Activities Committee. Among the well-informed witnesses testifying is J. Edgar Hoover, head of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Mr. Hoover speaks with authority on the subject. The factional fight within Mine Mill came to a head right after World War II, when America was in the grip of the biggest Red Scare since the Palmer Raids of 1919 and 1920. A leading figure in this was J. Edgar Hoover, the same man who had directed the attack on immigrant labor groups after World War I. Communism in reality is not a political party. It is a way of life, an evil and malignant way of life. It reveals a condition akin to disease that spreads like an epidemic. And like an epidemic, a quarantine is necessary to keep it from infecting this nation. Companies everywhere were quick to exploit public sentiment, and they used the fear of communist influence as a way of discrediting the entire labor movement. In the Brass Valley, the Scoville Manufacturing Company attacked unions in editorials like this one. Labor unions are particularly susceptible to infiltration by communists. The strike weapon is largely controlled by an aggressive minority. Disruption of production, violence, and hardship which accompany strikes are essential parts of the communist creed of revolution. We say, give them back to Russia. In 1947, Locals loyal to the right-wing faction seceded from Mine Mill and eventually joined the United Auto Workers. Two years later, Mine Mill was expelled from the CIO, along with ten other unions that were accused of being communist-dominated. Mine Mill was deprived of all rights under federal labor laws and suffered years of harassment, subversive activities charges, and raiding by other unions. In 1967, a seriously weakened mine mill merged with the United Steelworkers of America. With the workers now split up into different unions, it became more difficult for them to bargain with the giant copper and brass corporations. Workers like John Gaddison were keenly aware of how strong they might have been if they'd stayed in one union. That was one of the best setups that, you know, we could have had because you're dealing strictly in one industry. But, uh, Things went wrong, and mine mill went under, and then we were chopped up, and we've been kind of powerless since then. Not that force. If we had got out of mine mill lock, stock, and barrel, and went into the um, steel workers, or went into the auto workers, or whatnot, but if we should have all gone one way. Reconversion of war plants to peacetime pursuits is going ahead at full speed, and once more the automobile factories are humming as huge stamping presses form the bodies of the first automobiles produced since the spring of 1942. Many new inventions will grace store shelves. This cordless iron, for example, eliminates many of the nuisances connected with the family wash. Store windows are once more blossoming as they did before Pearl Harbor with every gadget dear to Americans. And by the thousands, people are flocking to automobile display rooms. The United States of America emerged from World War II as the world's dominant economic power. And by the early 50s, the nation was enjoying the biggest economic boom in its history. With raw material from dozens of lands, American workers were turning out an endless stream of products from industrial machinery to portable radios. Soon, one-third of all the world's exports were coming from the U.S. For workers, the question was, 
how much would they benefit from all this prosperity? The answer to that would depend largely on how strong their unions were. But in the Brass Valley, many local unions were still weak. Weak from the union factional struggles, and also weak because of the stiff opposition of Brass Company management. Alan Curtis, Vice President of the Scoville Manufacturing Company. Many negotiators enter negotiations with the attitude, what will I have to give the union this time? But management should enter negotiations with the definite policy that it will not give away or dilute management's rights. In 1952, union contracts expired at many plants in the Brass Valley, and 10,000 workers went on strike. The key struggle was at Scoville. It was the biggest brass plant in the area, but among its thousands of workers, only a small minority were actually union members. Sid Monty was president of the Scoville local at that time. The company felt sure that they could beat us in a strike, and Curtis was the ringleader. In fact, he made statements to several people among management pe personnel of other plants who later let us know about it that this was the time to take them on once and for all to break their back. And to tell you the truth, I think we had collected dues from 600 mem members the month of May. And when that strike was called, well, I was looking to see if my pants would be dirty because I didn't know how many people were going to go in. But boy, it was wonderful. I don't think 150 people went in that plant that day. Scoville had a history of being uh, SOBs as far as the workers were concerned. And they were so big, and they employed so many, that they had, everybody in town had some relative or, or a very good friend working in Scovels, and they knew they had been mistreated. The solidarity began because people in this town were just fed up. And I think they realized that we were fighting for their good. Comes a time you have to fight for what you believe in, and I think that was the time. The response to the strike was completely unexpected. By the third day, there were more than 2,000 people on the picket line in front of Scoville's main gate. In the weeks that followed, the company and the workers fought on many fronts. They used every trick in the book. They, they turned uh, you against your union organizer or union rep. Uh, they tried to turn you against the local. They, they, the boss would call, they, they, then they got the telephone bit going, they, they would call you, tell you if you don't come back, you're going to lose your job. There was no, you know, they didn't say you were fired. They didn't use the word you were fired. They said that, you know, if you doesn't come back, you're going to lose your job. They told her, I got word out to certain people, to other companies, not to hire people that was on strike, so that that way they couldn't hold out, they wouldn't survive. Creditors just, like, mounted and called and threatened to come and get the refrigerator out the kitchen. So, you know, it was, it, was really, um, it was really rough. While the company applied economic and psychological pressure, the strikers received encouragement from sometimes unexpected quarters, as Sid Monty did when he was arrested on the picket line for allegedly attacking a truck driver. And this is the sergeant that took me down, uh, one round all, and he's an old-time fighter, and he was saying his beads all the way down, saying, you know, he apologized to me, I'm sorry, you know, because he had a whole f list of people from his family that worked in schools and got mistreated. Uh, they, uh, we had public support. And, of course, I know if I wanted to be a scab, I don't think I'd have nerve enough to do it. You've you got followed. I remember being out in one gate, mostly men, come, and we'd try and stop the cars. And, and this one car grabbed me, and he was really fresh and on. So I looked over, and we had some big guys over there on the picket line. I just looked at them and said, hey, fellas, uh, you insist going there. How about give me a hand rocking the car? Well, over they came, you know, and they were really intimidated because they were big bruises. And they all grabbed the handle of the car and we were rocking it and rocking the cops looking the other way and they didn't see nothing, you know. We were out of the way of the management pretty good. They didn't have a camera. We always checked if they had any cameras on it. And uh, he took off. He almost killed us when he backed up so fast, but took off. And then at night time, we'd uh, get together and we'd go out. I used to drive the car most of the time with the fellows in there. We did a little damage around. We had, we had to get back at him some way. 
It was a good summer. They had egg on their face, so they had to brazen it out, too, but they really made us solid. After many months on strike, the workers at Scoville got their contract, providing them with wage increases, pensions, paid holidays, a better seniority system, in short, a piece of the prosperity that American industry was enjoying. The principal thing that they did was to, to recognize that by staying together, they could achieve certain objectives. They could solve some of the problems that were prevalent in Department X, Y, or Z. We solidified a union, that's what we did. We made a, a trade union out of a, guys, a bunch of guys who were reluctant to play and dues by hand. You said people got brave for this. Yeah, yeah, it was, like they got union stewards and people got, uh, you know, talk up to the boss, like, you know, this is not right, I'm not gonna take it, I'm not gonna work on this machine today, and this and the other, and uh, they really did, they, they learned to speak up. The strike of 1952 was a turning point for the Brass Valley. A process of organizing which had begun in the depths of the depression seemed to be paying off on the threshold of post-war prosperity. The economic boom rolled on with a few interruptions right into the 1960s. As their incomes rose and job security increased, many workers left their old ethnic neighborhoods and bought homes in the suburbs. They bought cars, enjoyed longer vacations, and could look forward to sending their children to college. Meanwhile, their unions took their place alongside other institutions in the Naugatuck Valley. They got involved in public service and political campaigns. The unions treated their power and respectability with care, becoming guardians of stability as well as agents of change. By the 60s and 70s, the hardships and militant union struggles of the past had begun to seem like ancient history. To many workers, yearly wage and benefit increases were now simply a matter of course. Uh, I, I, I saw it gradually getting where there were fewer and fewer people uh, rallying to the cause, as it were, uh, than there was in the original instance, uh, for example, in Scoville case, immediately following the strike. Uh, you know, you couldn't get a hall big enough to hold a, a monthly membership meeting. Then all of a sudden you can ha have a monthly membership meeting in a telephone booth unless you were having ratification of a contract. I think um, we get very complacent. Uh, like I think I told you before, I remember this old Italian man always said to me that uh, he was a smart old man, and he used to say, uh, the trouble of the people's bellies are full. You take things for granted. I think people get cynical, and it's very hard to get anything accomplished, and it just takes so long, like arbitration cases take six months to a year, and they just don't see any end to it, and they figure what little you accomplish, what's it worth? Labor unions, well, I, I think I can think of some of my own friends, you know, when they first did that, they were really lean. Now they're, well, they really need outside girdles to keep the, they win to win. And you know, you can't, and they've lost touch with the little guy, and that's bad. In the post-war decades, women and minority workers have increasingly been the little guy in the brass plants. They comprise a large segment of the workforce, but the leadership of their unions often fails to reflect either their numbers or their concerns. We would have some of the officials, uh, the union officials, uh, sitting down and trying to help us work out a um, plan whereby uh, there were bigger uh, uh, promotions, uh, not, not only in the um, plant, but also in the ranks of the uh, organized labor, you see. And they never disagree with you. They always agreed with you and uh, always help you work out. A, uh, something looks very good on paper. But uh, at night or some other time, you find also they go right behind your back and, uh, you know, they, it's a different story. And uh, when these things were found out naturally, it was discouraging. The local union should now do some planning 
on how to get the maximum contributions to this year's drive. Most other international unions have now raised their requested contributions to $5 and $10 per member. The role of the women in the union is not good. Uh, they're a little better than they were, but women are used. Women do the dirty work and not recognize. And that goes on today. But to take, uh, to take leadership, no. And as I said, we were not encouraged. Uh, Despite the efforts of women and minority workers to achieve equality, the brass industry workforce remains divided. Black workers face prejudice at work and in their communities. While most women remain segregated in the lower paying manufacturing jobs, like their mothers and grandmothers before them. They've had women come in there, they get harassed and all, and it takes a really strong woman to make it because guys will make all sexist comments all the time. They won't give her a break, they give another guy coming in the mill. They're keeping the women out of the mill. They're keeping the men in there and keeping men and women fighting, blacks and whites fighting. They keep the people, a guy working next to you every day. He's a black guy. You talk to him every day. And then you get on the outside and they tell you that he's going to move into your neighborhood and make it slummy. He's in your neighborhood. He's right next door to you and work. And you get along fine, but somehow on the outside he's somebody different. Yet this boss who's getting on your case every day, it's all right if he lives next door. I mean, they just keep us fighting each other so that, that we don't contend with the real problem, who's really bothering us. The divisions that plague the workforce in the Brass Valley have been aggravated in recent years by the fact that workers have all been competing for fewer and fewer jobs. The problem began in the 50s, as copper and brass met with stiff competition from new materials, like plastic and aluminum. Dozens of manufacturers were switching over, and the Naugatuck Valley Brass Companies lost one customer after another. But that's not the whole story. Worldwide, the market for copper and brass was actually expanding. Foreign brass makers were building modern production facilities, and were able to capture a bigger share of the world market. The big three, Scoville, Anaconda, and Kennecott, began lagging behind. But they were already involved in a multitude of other businesses around the world. So they simply took their profits from the Naugatuck Valley and invested them elsewhere. As their brass plants grew old and obsolete, they usually chose to shut them down rather than refurbish them, destroying thousands of jobs along the way. This process reached a crisis point in the mid-70s when the brass companies tried to force concessions from the workers by threatening massive shutdowns and layoffs. It was the biggest challenge to confront the Brass Valley unions in the four decades of their existence. Sometimes they were able to hold their ground. Sometimes they weren't. The first showdown came at Chase Brass, the Kennecott subsidiary. By then, Bill Moriarty was a UAW staff member. In Chase's, we had made more concessions to that company than any other brass company in this whole area. We gave them relief in areas where it was dangerous for us to do that. Now, the committee was saying that uh, we have to ha wear hard hats all over the plant because the bricks are falling out of the roof. But they were kept conning us into, if you give us a little more time, you'll stay in business. Okay. Well. It was reported to me during the negotiations that the board of directors Chase had voted a year and a half prior to the termination of the contract that they were going to close down the Chase Brass in Waterbury. And I confronted them with that across the bargaining table, and they did not deny it. In 1976, Chase, as planned, shut down its major Waterbury operations forever. Today, the Chase parent company, Kennecott Copper, is a subsidiary of Standard Oil of Ohio. In 1977, workers faced a similar situation at Anaconda, another of the big three brass makers. By 1960, Anaconda was well underway with a plan to transfer its assets out of the Naugatuck Valley. They shut down production lines, tore down buildings, and slashed the workforce by 50%. At the same time, they were expanding their facilities in Mexico, Brazil, Puerto Rico, and many other countries. 
In 1977, Anaconda was bought by Arco, the Atlantic Richfield Oil Company, for $700 million. The resulting company was one of the largest in the world. Arco attempted to roll back many of the gains Anaconda workers had made over the years. They imposed a combination of speed-ups and compulsory overtime and maintained the threat that if workers were not productive enough, their plant might be shut down. When I got there 16 years ago, we had over, a little over 1,000 employees. Today, we got 450 people. We're putting out twice as much work with half of the employees we had 10, 15 years ago. <laughs> Everybody else, when a guy retires years ago, the job went up for bid. Today, they just before that guy's going to get out six months earlier, they're looking around, who could they add that job onto, okay? And maybe we'll throw them five cents an hour or six cents an hour. Maybe we won't throw them anything. We've made this plant operate not on new equipment. You know, the company has not made it operate on new equipment. The employees have kept the plant running on productivity. I've worked 80, 90, 100, 110 hours a week. 110 hours a week? Right. Sure. And if and you don't, you lose your job. And if you don't, they're telling you. You're going to get a warning. You're going to get a warning or three days off, or we'll take it to arbitration. You know, you go out when we want you, we'll call you. You know, and this is what they're trying to do to us now. They want to dictate more. They'll, they want to be the ones to say how many hours is sufficient to work. If they say you have to work 120 hours, either work it or goodbye, find another you know. job. You're just another machine, and, and it, it just gets to you. You're told to push more and everything. You work more, produce more, and they don't take it into consideration that you have your point where you can't do anymore. You plus go constantly retying the job to see, try and pick up any little trick an operator learned, which is his trick. He doesn't owe it to the company, but... They figure you work there, you owe everything to the company. Six months after Arco took over Anaconda, union contracts expired at many of Anaconda's brass plants, including those in the Naugatuck Valley. A coalition of unions was involved in negotiations. The machinists, the UAW, and the steelworkers. Anaconda told the workers that the company had lost its competitive edge because of excessive labor costs and demanded wage and benefit concessions. Donald Doyle, a spokesman for Anaconda. We have to be competitive, and along with that comes uh, the unfortunate part of, of telling people that, in essence, they've been overpaid for a number of years. Because they lived beyond their means for several years doesn't mean that they shouldn't now uh, conform to what the demands of society are. The alternatives are not very good. What would they be? They would be closing the facilities and not having jobs and that, not having a brass division business. Is that a possibility, a real possibility? Well, of course. If, if we've seen a third of our operations close in the past 10 years, we've seen 50% of the bargaining unit people laid off and their jobs ended in 10 years, uh, then there's nothing that, that precludes a continuation of that kind of thing if the division can't become profitable and can't become competitive. They want to cut wages when we ain't going to let them. As simple as that. If they cut retirement and cut 
your friend benefits and everything else. That's cutting wages. Plus, uh, they do away with cost of living. You turn the TV or radio on, what's on there? This is going to go up within the, 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 the next few days. This is going up. I, I mean, hey, so is everything going up? The creation of the fight is with the companies themselves. They, they have problems that they ha have not been able to uh, solve, and they figure the easiest way out is to take and lower the wages, and then all their problems are going to be solved. Now, if we're going to start this kind of a trend in this area, and then it's going to mushroom into other areas, where is labor going to wind up at? Early in the strike, Anaconda won an injunction limiting the size of the picket lines. They tried to keep the plants running with white-collar employees, something the company had never done in any previous strike. And they invited strikers to return to work individually without a contract. They ran a vicious campaign. They sent people letters. They phoned people. Now we got an individual up there, I won't mention names. We call him the full of brush man. They even send him to the people's houses asking them to come back to door work. to door door to door like the old full of brush man you know uh, what do you got to offer today in march 1978 Anaconda dropped its demand for wage concessions and offered a small cost of living increase. The steelworkers local in Ansonia turned it down because the contract did not address the issues of speed up and compulsory overtime in their plant. But within the nationwide coalition, a majority voted to accept the offer and everyone went back to work. The strike had lasted six months. For a lot of the guys, it was a shock into real reality. They thought, that it was a great company and they had a great job and they were secure. They finally found out that they aren't as secure as they thought they were. When I started in 68, there was a difference. Back then, all the older timers were saying, look at how good you have it today. We had it so tough. But it seems like now things are swinging around. We've, we're getting it tough again. We're fighting overtime. We're fighting for our wage. They want to take our money away. We're fighting to keep up with the price of oil, which my company produces. I, I, I mean, it's like you, we're fighting the old fights again. In the mid-70s, Scoville was still the biggest employer in the Naugatuck Valley brass industry. But by then, Scoville was also a billion-dollar conglomerate, and its aging brass plants were a drag on the company's profits. In 1975, a group of investors made a deal to buy the plants at a bargain price, with loans that were guaranteed by the state of Connecticut. There was one hitch. The buyers and the state insisted that the workers take a three-year wage freeze, or else the whole deal would fall through and the plants would close down forever. So the workers took the freeze, and the Scoville Brass Plant became Century Brass Products Incorporated. Alex Lopez has worked in that plant since 1953. After this man come down and bought the place, you know, of course he, he do good, but he, he feel, you know, they feel like a hero, you know, we save, I save, you know, but he make his money, and after that, we only get one race, that's all. But see what they do? Most everything is piecework. Mm -hmm. It's a system they got you know, to make people work. You work piecework, you don't need no boss around you. See? You just work. If you don't work, you don't get paid. So later on, they come down and they cut the prices. Now they got to work so hard to make 
time, sometimes five minutes to twelve, but they still going, you know. Sometimes twelve o'clock, they still going. So, otherwise they, the raise they give, they get them back again. have a man to sweep up the place and there's nobody doing that no more like they used to sweep around with the machine no they only do uh, emergency you know like the machine I gotta fix the machine first you know because that machine but the floor hey never mind we don't use that floor for nothing you just gotta break your neck to soak it you go in the alley or grease and it's about as thick. So the whole idea is to save money. Yeah, money. In five years, Century laid off 500 employees. While their production facilities deteriorated, Century executives drew generous salaries and bonuses and used Century Brass assets to buy up other companies. 1981 was a contract year. Management's claim, the company had no money. They demanded another three-year wage freeze and a reduction in benefits. Most importantly, Century wanted the right to stop making pension fund contributions. Strike, strike. Well, I woke dark on it. Woke for strike. Taking everything away from me, gotta get something. Benefits. People can only take so much. We've taken six years of aggravation. Each brother and sister in this union have put up with enough aggravation. Now we want some decency. When we're going down, we're going down too long. Taking away a man's pension is about as wrong as you can get. And anything that ain't worth fighting for ain't worth having. And this time we're fighting. That's right. The company wants us to live in poverty, and we can't do that. The locale for this confrontation was all too familiar. It was the same plant gate where thousands of immigrants had marched as members of the New England Workers Association in 1920. And it was the same plant gate where the children of those immigrants had picketed during the big strike of 1952. I think you think, you think the goddamn the whole police force was in there. And they jumped on everybody, they pulled them on the ground, hit them on the head, I got mace in my eyes. And they got one poor guy, the guy's an old man. They hand him up a gun, hand handcuffs on him. For God's sake, what the hell is this? I see the cop, my own eyes, pushing old lady. That's how much respect they got for us. We're doing what we gotta do. Let them do what they gotta do. They ain't gotta get pushed. They said they want to arrest me. Yes, I'm right here. I'll be out in a minute. A minute. The union's behind me. Why did the Waller try to let the cars in? Naturally, you're not gonna let the cars in. That easy, you know? Like, you could have done with the nurses. They let one in at a time and waited, but no. They had them lined up all down here, all around. Yeah, a flea couldn't have got through here. Early in the strike, 
Century announced that they were on the verge of liquidating their assets and going out of business for good. Negotiators quickly worked out a compromise. The workers would take a one-year wage freeze, and Century would keep the plant open. The workers took the freeze and went back to work. Six months later, parts of the mill were operating only part-time, or not at all, and many workers were on layoff. Right now, everybody, not just me, but everybody is wondering, you know, what's going to happen? And in my case, I am in the spot, because two, I got almost 29 years in there, that I'm not old enough to retire. So if anything happens now, I don't know what, what I'm going to get. I think it will happen a lot of places these days, you know. They, it's, the future is very in the dark, like, you know. The corporations have only one thing in mind, and that's to make profit no matter who the hell has to suffer for it. And the worker has, uh, you know, he's, he's up against it when he's got that kind of a, of a situation uh, confronting him uh, in his place of employment. He doesn't mean anything except how much he can produce in terms of dollars for the corporation. He doesn't mean a damn thing. When the corporations and companies were making gigantic profits, they never did want to share with the worker. The workers always had to struggle. And uh, no progress has ever been made without struggle in the labor movement. Nobody has been willing to give the laboring man anything unless he has fought for him. We do have, we owe each coming generation a better life. And that is one, uh, one of the things I feel that we're put on this earth to make life better for those to come after us.